And our last speaker of this session is Dr. Emily Eads, who is an assistant professor of radiology in the breast imaging division at UT Southwestern. She earned her medical degree, completed her residency and fellowship training in breast imaging all at Duke University School of Medicine. The title of her presentation is Breast Imaging, When, What, Why? Good afternoon. So the purpose of this talk is to give you all a sense of when to order a screening mammogram, a diagnostic mammogram, breast ultrasound, and MRI. And much like Dr. Abara, I would argue that breast imaging is at risk of being underutilized. Um, and, and much of this is due to some of the confusing screening recommendations, which we'll talk a little bit about in just a moment. So we will start with screening mammography. So screening mammography is recommended for asymptomatic patients annually beginning at the age of 40, or 10 years before the age of diagnosis of a first-degree relative. What do we do? A standard four-view mammogram. And why do we do this? Because one in eight women will be diagnosed with breast cancer, and 76% of women who are diagnosed have no family history. We're trying to find small, node-negative breast cancers, and observational studies have shown a 30% reduction in mortality due to breast cancer from screening mammography. This is an example of a standard screening mammogram with craniocaudal and mediolateral oblique views of both breasts. And here is a summary of the current screening mammography guidelines. Um, it's very confusing to patients and referring clinicians what to recommend, and so I'm kind of summarizing the data for you here. The American College of Radiology, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, and the National Comprehensive Cancer Network all recommend annual screening mammography beginning at age 40. Over the age of 75, that decision should be based on the health of the patient. If she's relatively healthy and would pursue treatment if a breast cancer was found, then she should have a screening mammogram. The American Cancer Society complicates things a little bit further. They say that all women should have the opportunity to begin screening at age 40. They should definitely get screening mammograms annually between the ages of 45 and 54, where the incidence of breast cancer bumps. And then at the age of 55 to 75, they should consider transitioning to every other year or biennial screening, but they should have the opportunity to continue annual screening if they want to. Um, further complicating matters is the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force, and they say that the individual decision should be based on patient values of potential benefits and harms. They recommend only annual, uh, excuse me, every other year or biennial screening between the ages of um, 50 to 74. What they're ignoring is the fact that the incidence of breast cancer is the same in the 45 to 50 age group as the 50 to 54 age group. And the harms of a false positive mammogram and maybe a few extra pictures or possibly a biopsy are relatively minor compared to the harm of missing a breast cancer and losing a life. Um, because of this, we know that the most lives are saved by beginning annual screening mammography at age 40, and that is our current recommendation. So a patient is imaged, she goes home and gets a letter in the mail saying either her study is normal or she needs to come back for additional imaging. The physician gets a report with a BIRADS uh, category assessment, either one negative, two benign, or zero needs additional imaging or comparison with prior exams. Because of Texas's breast density notification law, she's also notified if she has dense breast tissue because those women who have dense breasts may benefit from supplemental screening. So here's a mammographic representation of the variety of breast densities that we can see on a mammogram. On the far left is almost entirely fatty. Next is scattered areas of fibroglandular density. These both fall in the not dense category. Heterogeneously dense breasts have more of that white fibroglandular tissue. And then the extremely dense breasts have predominantly that white fibroglandular tissue. The challenge is that breast cancers are white on a mammogram, so the more breast tissue that you have, the higher the chances that you might miss a breast cancer hiding in that tissue. This is known as the masking effect. 
So when should we consider supplemental screening? Well, in women who have dense breasts, because of that masking effect that we just talked about, um, also, they're at a four to six times risk of breast cancer just based on the fact that they have higher breast density. In women who have intermediate risk of breast cancer, that's a 15 to 20 percent lifetime risk. Um, they should also be considered for supplemental screening. This includes people with a personal history of breast or ovarian cancer, a prior biopsy demonstrating lobular neoplasia, or atypical ductal hyperplasia. Both the dense breast and intermediate risk women may benefit from supplemental screening ultrasound. The high risk women would benefit from screening breast MRI, which we'll talk about in just a moment. And all women can really benefit from tomosynthesis or a 3D mammogram. So why do we do supplemental screening? The reason is to increase to cause an incremental increase in the cancer detection rate, and we'll talk about what that is for each study in just a moment. So first, tomosynthesis. All women can benefit from tomosynthesis exams. Essentially, multiple slices are obtained through the breast tissue at the time of the screening mammogram, and our studies have shown that the cancer detection rate increases by 28% when you add this to screening mammography. That's an additional one to three cancers per thousand women screened. The percent increase in invasive cancer detection is 40%. And we see a benefit in women of all breast densities, but this benefit is even greater in women who have dense breast tissue. As an added bonus, the recall rate or false positive rate of mammography goes down when you add tomosynthesis, approximately 15%. This addresses one of those so-called harms of screening mammography. So here's just an example of a mammogram. This woman has heterogeneously dense breasts. It can be hard to find the white cancer hiding amongst her white breast tissue. So when we do a tomosynthesis exam, I'm just going to kind of scroll through the images. And you can see there's a stack of images. As you, becoming, as you come closer to the mass, it becomes more in focus. And maybe you can appreciate in the lateral breast, there's this high density mass with some irregular margins. We can look at it on the other view as well. I'm kind of scrolling through the breast tissue. You eliminate some of that tissue overlap phenomenon that you see on the mammogram. And as I get about here, you can maybe appreciate that speculated mass in the upper outer quadrant. Here's another example of tomosynthesis to see how it helps. You can see an obvious mass in the right breast. On the tomosynthesis, you can see the margins are well circumscribed. And then you also see a small little speculated mass in the left breast which wasn't seen on the mammogram. Ultrasound of the right breast, the obvious finding is a benign simple cyst. And on the left is an invasive ductal carcinoma, which we would have missed had she not had a tomosynthesis. So women who have dense breasts or intermediate risk of breast cancer might benefit from screening ultrasound. In the Akron 6666 study, they screened high-risk women with dense breasts, and they found an additional two to four cancers per 1,000 women, women screened. The problem with screening ultrasound, however, is a very high false positive rate. So in the first year they did the study, there was 10% um, of women underwent biopsies. This went down a little bit in years two and three to 7%, but it's still much higher than screening mammography alone, which is only 2% biopsy rate. And of the biopsies that were performed, only about 9% of them were cancer. This, again, is very low compared to the mammography benchmark of 20 to 40%. It's for these reasons that screening ultrasound hasn't been widely adopted. For high-risk women, we recommend screening MRIs annually. And in this category are women with a BRCA1 or 2 mutation if they have a greater than 20% lifetime risk of breast cancer based on a risk assessment tool such as those listed here. This only accounts for about 0.5% of women undergoing screening. And it also includes women with a history of chest irradiation between ages 10 and 30. This is typically women with a history of Hodgkin's lymphoma and mantle radiation. For these women, we recommend an annual mammogram and an MRI beginning at age 25 to 30 or 10 years before the age of diagnosis of a first-degree relative, or beginning eight years after treatment with mantle, ra uh, mantle radiation. But we don't do mammograms before the age of 25. So here's just an example of a screening MRI. 
The combined sensitivity with mammography is approximately 93 to 100%. This is much higher than in the high-risk screening population where mammography and ultrasound combined is only 52%. An additional 15 cancers are found per 1,000 women screened, and we typically do the MRIs alternating every six months with mammography. Here's a small little screening detected cancer in the right breast. MRI does not replace the need for mammography because some cancers, such as DCIS, present as calcifications, and those can only be seen on the mammogram. So we've talked about screening, so we'll talk a little bit about diagnostic evaluation. When do you order a diagnostic mammogram? First of all, if you have a symptomatic patient, if she's got a palpable abnormality, clear or bloody, spontaneous, unilateral nipple discharge, nipple retraction, focal pain, if she had an abnormal screening mammogram and a cancer follow-up patient after a lumpectomy, we typically see those patients every six months for three years, although that depends on the institution. And for BIRADS three, probably benign lesions, we follow those for two years. What do we do? We do additional mammographic views, maybe a compression view or a magnification view. We ultrasound all clinical findings, and we ultrasound, if indicated, persistent abnormal mam mammographic findings. So why do we do the diagnostic mammogram? First of all, we want to make sure a mammographic finding is real and it's not just overlapping tissue. And the ultrasound can help differentiate between uh, solid and cystic masses and help identify mammographically occult lesions. So here are examples of microcalcifications that were recalled from screening mammography. And on the magnification views, they're all suspicious and stereotactic biopsy demonstrated DCIS. Here are masses recalled from screening mammography. Spot compression views were done. They show circumscribed margins. And the ultrasound on the first case shows a simple cyst. On the second case, we see a solid mass. This was a fibroadenoma on biopsy. If a patient has a palpable abnormality, it must be evaluated by ultrasound in addition to a mammogram. Here, there's a BB denoting the palpable abnormality. You can see that there's a subtle increase in density or a focal asymmetry at the palpable finding, but no discrete mass. Tomosynthesis demonstrates similar findings, no obvious mass. But ultrasound, you can see there's obviously a suspicious irregular mass. And MRI even more clearly shows that abnormal enhancing mass, which was an invasive lobular carcinoma on biopsy. When to order an ultrasound? If the patient is less than 30 years old, we always begin our diagnostic evaluation with an ultrasound. Over the age of 30, we typically incorporate that in our diagnostic evaluation of clinical and mammographic abnormalities. Here you can see a simple cyst versus the solid fibroadenoma. And sometimes we'll see these um, suspicious irregular masses, in this case an invasive ductal carcinoma. Women get their results at the time of their diagnostic evaluation, and the referring clinician gets a BIRADS assessment of one to six. Four and five are both suspicious for malignancy, and five is highly suspicious, greater than 95% chance of malignancy. An MRI can be performed in the screening population, like we talked about. Um, it can also be performed in patients with a known cancer to screen the contralateral breast for malignancy. We can see that in about 4% of patients. We can evaluate for multifocal disease or multicentric disease within the same breast, which is seen in about 15% of patients. We can look for chest wall invasion, look for bulky residual tumor in patients with a post-lumpectomy positive margin, and assess uh, response to neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Rarely do we use MRI to further evaluate inconclusive imaging findings. And keep in mind that MRI is never a substitute for biopsy of suspicious imaging findings at mammography or ultrasound. We can also do MRI without contrast to evaluate for implant rupture. This is for silicone implants. We can evaluate intracapsular rupture seen on this middle image, which is difficult to see at mammography and ultrasound. Extracapsular silicone can often be seen at mammography, but also is well demonstrated by MRI. And saline implant rupture is usually clinically obvious due to deflation of the implant and change in contour of the breast. We typically perform any needed procedures after we give a BIRADS assessment of four or five. 
Here's an example of a needle going into a complicated cyst with a fluid debris level and resolution of that cyst. We perform ultrasound-guided biopsies of solid masses and stereotactic biopsies of calcifications. We also perform MRI-guided biopsies of suspicious enhancing lesions without sonographic correlates. So in summary, here are the recommendations for when to order a screening mammogram, a diagnostic mammogram, an ultrasound, and an MRI. Thank you.